All right, let's play money making game. So oh yeah. Which I'm one? assuming people would get the reference. I Though, hope so. I wonder how many people actually read the descriptions of what these panels are, or just look at the title and think, oh, money making, monetization, something like that. I'm just gonna go to it. Yeah, this panel is actually all about how this money making game was coded and how to get the plus fifty every single time. <laughs> so I mean, if you don't want to hear an hour about like you know NES assembly, this is the place for you. <laughs> No, what is this panel really about? All right, so this panel is about the fact that, look, all right? Oh, right, I forgot the panel. I forgot the slide order. You Mr. forgot Rick. the slide order, I Captain. Indeed. All right, so money-making game. Every, you know, some people, most people, right, who play games or enjoy any sort of media, right, at some point you feel like you want to make that media. If you do, right, even if you were to succeed, but everyone has the idea, right? You have some vision of some game you've imagined. That's why that like pitch your game idea panel is so popular, even though those guys just sit up there and are like, okay, we're making these people happy. We're just gonna sit here and smile for an hour, yeah, <laughs> right? But you know, you have some vision of some game, you wanna make it, right? But you also have to eat food, right? <laughs> or you will die <laughs> and it won't be fun. And you know, coming to the BCEC makes it really hard to eat food. Right? There's pretty much none around here. It's like, where is that dude selling that meat on a stick? I need to get past the crumple grumble guy. <laughs> uh, anyway, all right? You know, but you know, and people are always talking about all the time, especially recently. You know, how to make more money, right? What's the best way to make the most money? Which you know way should you do this? You know, should you do some microtransactions? Do I go do... free to play, the head based economy that's very popular now? Right, and it's all about how to make more money, right? But we don't care about making money. We care about playing games because we don't make them. We just care about playing. Right? And the fact is, is that depending on how you choose how you're going to make that money, the game gets affected. Sometimes ruined, sometimes not ruined, often ruined. Uh, and we want to talk about that. All right? so, but first, right, we have to talk about what is a game. So, you know, I bring this up in every lecture, every panel, but it is important. Because what is a game? I mean, Angry Birds is a game, so is Farmville, so is Patty Cake, so is Tic-Tac-Toe, so is a pheasant. So, we're not going to argue at all about what game is, what kind of game is better than some other kind of game. We're not going to really quibble over the definition of game. Because in this case, we're talking about what you want to do. Give me that clicker if you're not going to slide. I'm there sliding. There we go. I'm, I'm sliding. sliding now. All right. So you have to think about what is the game you're trying to make. Do you care if it's a fair competi competitive test of one or more skills? One definition of a good game. Do you care if it's a series of interesting decisions? Maybe you're trying to make Patty Cake the game. That is what you want. But you have to think back to what type of game it is you're trying to make at all times. Because every monetization model is not just that it messes with your vision, but it'll mess with the fundamental core of what your game is. If you want a hardcore, competitive, we are fighting a fair test to see who is smarter or yeah. who is better. Who a is competitive faster. game, a major league game, right? Hockey, Counter-Strike. Something that's going to have tournaments and winners and prizes, right? And, you know, you can't, it won't be fair, right? It wouldn't be fair if you were playing Major League Baseball and one guy, you know, gets to use a metal bat because he spent a million dollars on it, right? That's BS. <laughs> now they can try to hack with the cork bat. <laughs> I guess. So you have to make sure you don't compromise on that or what's the point of even making your game if you compromise on your fundamental thing? So think back to this slide. Think about those kinds of games. But first, we have to talk it, about revision, because every lecture about money-making games, or games, or money, is the same, and people talk about how to make the most money, like Scott was alluding to. Now you're probably wondering why when we talk about a vision, there's a poison mushroom up there. Not right? a very nice vision. No, a very bad vision. See, we used to play Mario Party hardcore in uh, college. We had a championship belt. It that was, was official. So you we, would pass it to the current champions or contest for the belt. So we were, in a, we were in a battle for the tag team championship, and one of our opponents had this vision, right? A row of nothing but poison mushrooms all the way leading up to the beginning of the map, right? So anytime anyone got a poison mushroom, they would always put it. It was just this giant line, and he, he, you know, he, he said it. He believed it. He knew he could, he could make it happen, and he did make it happen. Every turn, he's like, come on, guys. It's a vision. Right? And by concentrating on that vision, keeping it in mind, keeping it in focus, row of poison mushrooms, and there were like 20 poison mushrooms in a row. Like when you hit that spot, the game slowed down to a crawl. It was like one, one, two, one. Oh, it was the worst. My and then because so you were going so slow, you got so many more turns, the odds of getting another poison mushroom to add by the, to the end of the row was pretty good. But despite the vision being so painful, people wanted it. They fought for it, and he did not compromise. That's right. We lost big time. But you gotta eat food. So, 
what if the vision is your game? You know, you want to make a game because you're passionate about gaming. You have this idea of, I want to make a game that's like Dota, but it does all these things differently because I hate the way Dota is. I want to, like, I want to get rid of the channels. I want it to be like, I don't know, like you're mining through and you're building structures. I want to make this, like, I have this specific game, and I want to make it. My dream is just to make this game happen. But if you can't eat food while you're making that game, then the game's not going to happen. So this is the biggest thing the core of this entire panel, that if you are designing a game, because you have to eat, the design of the game is fundamentally linked to the monetization model you choose. You can't, you know, you can't pick like, you know, some game, you know, freely, of the, pick the monetization model later, right? Because if you do, I mean, you could theoretically pick any monetization model with any game, you could. Right? But a lot of the combinations, if you don't have the game and the monetization model paired up correctly, you're going to make zero dollars or negative a lot of dollars. Now, a lot of <laughs> business people think you can do this. They think of it in terms of investment. I want to invest X dollars in this game company. I don't know what a game is, but they make them apparently. Oh, you're making a game? Well, I want it to be a subscription game. Yeah. They don't care what your game actually is. That's right. You know, and then when it actually comes, you know, you see a lot of times people change the monetization model of a game if it's not succeeding. No one's ever done that without also changing the game, right? You don't just leave the game alone and just be like, oh, okay, we're going to, right? They always do something to the game because you can't just change the money part without changing the game part. So this is the other thing that no one talks about. Everyone's focused on the after money, on I've made a game, how do I sell the most? But that is actually the least important part because you have a vision. You just want the game to happen. Your main goal, right, is to get that game out there. So you need to get the funding and everything to make that game and eat food at the same time before the game ever hits a press, ever goes gold. Yep, it's got before money and you got after money, right? The before money is the money you use to make the game and the after money is the money you get after the game is made by selling it to people who want to play it, right? You know, the before money might be zero dollars. Maybe it's you just work a job to get all the food and then... <laughs> You know, and then while you're working the job, you make the game at night. That's still a source of before money. That's your job, right? But already, this affects the game. Look at Dwarf Fortress. That guy is working pretty much by himself, hardcore, making this game, originally with his own resources all the way. So the game is taking an infinite amount of time to finish. The game has progressed a great light distance in the time he's made it, but think about how much farther it would have gotten if he'd had any amount of like real funding, or, or if he help. had a dev team, <laughs> or if he open source, if something had gone differently. So even if you say, oh, I'm not going to monetize my game, I'm going to work my day job, and I'm going to make the game, and I'm going to give it away for free. Well, your day job is still funding the game. You're tired after your day job. What if your day job is something that's similar, like you're looking at a screen all day, you go home, you look at the screen all night coding your game, you're gonna burn out, the game might not finish, or you'll start to fall off from the vision. That's right. You know, even the, the seemingly non-monetization models, right? Like freeware, open source game, right? Those are still monetization <laughs> models of before or after money, right? They're just, you know, ones that tend to have very, very low numbers associated with them. But they're now, still choices and they still affect your game. The most fun way to make a game is to already have the before money. Yes. Either because you're Gabe Newell or because you're in a company, you might have a budget, Someone, some angel investor might have said, here's $5 million, make a game, I want to see it in a year. You know, whatever it is, they've given you money, but there's always strings attached to that money. Yeah, I don't know if you people know the basic story right behind Valve Software, right? They made Half-Life 1 and it was in video game magazines for a long time and it was incredibly delayed before it finally came out and it was awesome. Uh, but the way they were able to do that and take forever and not worry about meeting a deadline or compromising their vision was because the people who started Valve Software, right, like Gabe Newell, they were previous Microsoft employees who made mad money at Microsoft, right? And they just carried their monies over, and so they were able to just keep working and keep eating uh, all the live long day until the game was finished. And because the game succeeded, all that after money carried over, and now we have Portal 2. So. Now, I know many of you are already thinking, but what if I'm independently wealthy? I just have, I'm a millionaire, and I can just make my game. Well, can you name a millionaire who is independently wealthy from like an inheritance or something like that, who just decided to make games and the games were good? Or even just anyone who decided to spend their money on games and didn't care how well they did? Is anyone here independently wealthy? You don't have to tell us. <laughs> just meet me after. My point is, that doesn't happen. So you could say, yes, technically you could, and yes, technically you could, but really, no. So there is a new option. This is the new hotness. There's a Kickstarter room at this con, because Kickstarter, gaming and Kickstarter are going hand in hand to a degree that is amazing. Look at how many games are being Kickstarted. 
Kickstarter gives you the before money with very few strings attached. You pick what strings you want attached to your money before you ask for the money. How great is that? But there is a little bit of a catch, right? You think, oh, I'll just put my idea up there and it'll succeed or fail. But only certain kinds of ideas, uh, certain kinds of ideas will succeed on Kickstarter. Things that pander to a nostalgic intellectual property uh, license. Right? Or a well, thing that has a very flashy and catchy demo or idea. Or really good video. Or something that's made by a famous person who has a strong following. These kinds of things are much more likely to get lots of before money from Kickstarter, right? My crazy idea for a game that only I will like is not going to get a lot of before money from Kickstarter, right? It's gonna get money from me, and that's it. It also necessitates that you have the ability to make rewards because no one's gonna kickstart you if they don't get any goodies. So even then, now you're considering, all right, get the game is probably one of the things in the Kickstarter. What are all the other things? Now you have to spend time on those too. Here's something people also don't think about, right? When you make a Kickstarter, one of those options is probably gonna be, and often is, you get the game, right? You're basically pre-ordering it, right? But that pre-order becomes the before money and is used up to buy food. Then when the game is done, there are less people to sell the game to because you used that money as before money. When you pre-order a game at GameStop, even though you're pre-ordering, that's after money. The game was developed using money from the, you know, the publishers or whatever, right? So if you make a game on Kickstarter that has a million fans, they give you all this before money. You spend all that before money developing the game, right? Because that was the, the funding for the budget. The game is out. You give the game to all those people. There's no one left in the world who wants the game. You have zero dollars. Right? You this might hasn't get. happened yet. But it's the math works that way, right? It's just, just how it is. So you build up a sort of debt and you get back to zero. So you can still get other forms of after money, like social currency. Now your game was popular, even if you didn't make any actual money after the fact on it, you made just enough money to make the game. Yeah, look at like Angry Birds, right? Okay, you know, they make a dollar per Angry Birds, which is a lot of after money. But let's say they didn't make that after money. Well, they're selling movies and cartoons and toys and all kinds of other nonsense, right? So just because you've kickstarted and given away a bunch of goodies, there's still other ways that you can maybe make after money if you are, you know, incredibly popular. It's, so, all hope is not lost. the poster child of all of this, the game that kind of kicked this entire conversation off, that made everyone start thinking about this, was Team Fortress 2. Of course. Right. Because Team Fortress 2, one, how many of you know the history of Team Fortress 2? The decade of waiting for this game to come out. I was in high school when Team Fortress 2 was on the horizon. There used to be a website, right, where you would put in your name and then you would do dot is waiting for TF2 dot whatever, right? And what would happen is you would go to that website and it would play this animated GIF of like all the, you know, the announcements that have been made about TF2 and all the screenshots that have been posted. George Bush was elected to office. Yeah, it's like this whole timeline, right? And then it's like Grim Waits. Da -da -da -da. Grim Waits. You know, and it's like, it shows just how long Rim has been waiting for Team Fortress It rivaled time. Duke Nukem. It had such this, like, huge pre-momentum that the game finally came out. And they brought it out in an interesting way. They just sold it. Standard model. The basic after-money model. I have my game. Here it is for X space dollars. But it was a little crook slightly so, right? The price was low. It wasn't $50. It was, like, what, 20 to buy it by itself originally? Something like that? And... The primary way to buy it was part of a pack, the orange box. A lot of people bought Team Fortress 2 and never played it. They were buying the orange box to get some other game. Yeah. I bought the orange box just for Team Fortress 2. <laughs> All right. Um, I got two So, you don't remember what you're going to say here, do you? Right, we're still talking about Team Fortress 2. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I do have half pack spots. I'm not kidding about that. He's been complaining to me for like the last hour before we got here. Like, I think I'm sick, Rim. I don't know what to do. We'll I see, think I'll I'm make dying. It. I'll make it. I'll make it. All right, so Team Fortress 2. So this two. model, just sell it. You think it's the simplest model when really it's not. For example, they already come in with a, like a bundle package or they sell the game by itself. And you all have learned that the price of games drops precipitously after the first few weeks. I mean, the game of the year edition of a popular game within a year or two is $15 and is fully loaded. And there's a whole game theory thing behind this, we won't really get into, but the Steam Summer Sale is pretty much the core of like what the problem is here. Even if you think you're just gonna sell your game, you have to worry about price discrimination. You want to sell the game to the dude who's been waiting for 10 years for it for a $1,000 because he'll pay any price. Right. Like if you're going to maximize the amount of money you make, right, you need to get the most sales for the most dollars per sale. If you, you could just set one price and keep it at that price forever, right? But there's some guy out there who is willing to pay $1 for it. 
You know, but if you set it at 50, you're never going to get that $1. Well, what if you set it at 50 from the get-go? All the guys willing to pay 50 pay it. And then later on, you set it to 1, and then you get all the 1s. We have more money in total. It's pretty simple. Uh, the problem is, right, is that, uh, you know, some games, you know, they're like single-player games. People play them, and they're done with them, right? And that's cool, right? You can just sell the game once, and that's it. But other games, for example, Team Fortress 2, multiplayer games. I mean, Counter-Strike is still played today by thousands and thousands of people. Go, go to Steam, right? Think about all the games that have come out. Call of Duties, Skyrims, all these games that have come out and since Counter-Strike has come out. You go to Steam, and you click on what's the most people playing right now. It's Counter-Strike and Counter-Strike. Right, so 1 in 0.6 and Source are up there. You know, when Skyrim comes out, it goes to number one temporarily, and then it goes down. And well, that was the case. There. They were number one and two until the free-to-play model came for Team Fortress 2. Until Team Fortress 2 said, we are going to move from a just-sell-it economy to a hat-based economy. That's right. I mean, Team they Fortress made something like 12 times the money they made in total sales in the whole time it was available in some number of months after they went free to play with this model. Like, right. it was ridiculous. Because think about it, the price was already so low, right, that anyone who wanted Team Fortress 2 and was willing to pay money to just play it had already paid that money. Yep, go back to price discrimination. If they had sold Team Fortress 2 for $5,000, 15 Ram scary dudes would have bought it. <laughs> if they'd sold it for $5, I would have bought it. A ton of people would have bought it, but they might have made less money. So they put it at a price point to where they knew the hardcore people would pay any price. They tried to pick the point where they'd get the most money right away. It's almost like they planned this whole thing. We don't know if they planned this whole thing or the not. The other thing is that, you know, it's a game, it's a multiplayer game. They keep updating it all the time, right? It costs them money for this game to exist, but no new people were buying the game, right? It's just people who already owned it were playing it, and in fact, less and less people were... It was still fairly popular, but less and less people were playing it. They were going back to Counter-Strike or going back to whatever other hobby they had, right? So they were spending all this money on Team Fortress 2. There was, it was still popular. People still played it, but they weren't getting any more revenues from it. It was just a money sinkhole. They had to find some other way to get money out of this game that you know was still existing and still carrying on so they sold hats and the thing is they did it in a very elegant and interesting way I mean it's very easy to say all right I'll have a free-to-play game but spend a dollar and get a better sword spend a dollar and get a better you know whatever but if you do that it's fundamentally changing the game so let's talk a little bit about game theory Rim's People who favorite. see our uh, lectures at other cons or at this con know that we like to bandy out scary game theory all the time. We're a game by itself? Fine, we're going to play a game. Theory, we got like gravity, we got particle physics, that's fun, but you put them together, game theory is not fun and it's barely about games. But I'll try to skip the math. There are some because intuitive things, it. actually I do know this one because it's fairly simple. <laughs> so you think if you're going to introduce this meta mechanic of buying things in a game, this external structure, I can pay a dollar to get a thing, uh, a League of Legends or a Dota-esque game where I can buy unique heroes that not every player will have access to, the game will become unfair in one sense because not everyone has access to the same options. But there is a way to make those options be still effectively fair in one fundamental sense. The colloquial or simple way to explain this is that you got to give something up to get something. Right, you know, pretty much every game you think about that has, you know, is, a, is a, um, an asymmetric game, right? Asymmetric game is where everyone has the exact same stuff. Think combat for the Atari. My tank is the same as Rim's tank. An asymmetric game is where you have different stuff, right? Starcraft. Well, yours I'm isn't because I always give you the, the crappy controller. <laughs> That's true. Or Street Fighter, right? I'm Guile, he's M. Bison. We have different stuff going on. That's an asymmetric game. How do you make an asymmetric game fair? It's pretty simple. Everyone knows, right? One guy is the fast guy who does a little bit of damage, and one guy is the slow, strong guy, right? And it balances out, you know, the different characteristics and stats. You know, okay, the wizard can deal a lot of damage to an area from far away, but he's mad weak. The warrior can get up close, and right? But then he takes a lot of damage, but he has a lot of hit points. And everyone is sort of equally effective in a different way. So, you know, this famous example, uh, I remember as a kid, I saw a friend of mine. I was, I was, uh, I don't know, eight, seven? I was a little kid. And I'm hanging out with my friend Joe Ogilvy. Maybe he'll see this and he'll be like, oh my god, Rim. <laughs> and he gave up the heart container and I slapped him. <laughs> <laughs> so, but imagine if this choice were give up a heart container or give up nothing. Well, duh, you're going to give up nothing. What if it was give up a heart container or swipe your credit card in the Nintendo and give up $5? That feels really bad and really unfair, doesn't it? That feels like crap. Because then Bill Gates is the best at Zelda. So, 
we'll do some scary math. But notice how there's no numbers on this graph. I see now, F1 and F2. This might seem Those a little counterintuitive. People traditionally draw these things this way because it's easier to visualize what's going on. Yeah, so this is backwards, right? In the bottom left corner, which is normally the nothing, zero, zero, that's actually the fastest, strongest guy, right? He's got the speed and the strength totally maxed out in the bottom left. And the far top right, that's the guy who can't move and can't even lift his so finger So this off could the be any number of factors. This could be any number of dimensions. We can do this in three, four, five, a million dimensions. It's all a matter of processing power. The idea is that mathematically, if a character gives something up, they have to get something else, but they can't get something else without giving something up. It's called Pareto efficiency. Pareto is a famous mathematician and game theorist from a long time ago. There's this cool idea that I learned about from Dr. Hazard, who did Akron, the time-traveling RTS. Who's a real game theorist and a real doctor. Whose name is Dr. Hazard. How cool is that? And then he told us the word Pareto Frontier, and then we read about it in Wikipedia, and that's why we know what we know. So <laughs> the idea of the Pareto Frontier is that if you have a number of options, pretend those are all characters you can pick in a fighting game. Right. Every character who is not on that line, that Pareto Frontier, is fundamentally, mathematically, objectively worse than any character that is on the Pareto Frontier. Right. Because so you can get better without giving up anything. Right, character A and character B. Okay, one guy's a little faster, a little weaker, one guy's a little stronger, a little slower, right? But they're both on the frontier. There are no characters closer to the bottom left than they are. To get any strength, you have to give up at least some speed. Right, but character C, he just sucks. <laughs> There's no reason to ever pick character C because you could just pick character A, who is just faster and isn't any less strong, or character B, who's just stronger but isn't any more slow. Right? So there's no reason to ever pick character C. Now this does not guarantee that all the characters are fundamentally, universally fair in all possible senses along the Pareto Frontier. Yeah, one character might be better in the mountains and one might be better in the water. Or one might require more player skill or less player skill. There's other measures of fair. But you at least have to get this type of fair right. Now to bring it back to Team Fortress 2 and monetization and your vision. Always bring it back to the vision. What if we do that? What if I sell a heavy who just is a little bit faster? If I do that, that heavy is outside of the Pareto Frontier. I've moved the Pareto Frontier. So now there's two Pareto Frontiers. The one for people who pay money and the one for people who don't pay money. Daddy too. How is that fair? Now the game is fundamentally unfair because you've got two completely different sets of players. The players who have access to those characters have fundamentally better options in your game. Now, if your vision is a competitive test of one or more skills, you have ruined that vision. That's right. If you wanted to make a game that was a fair game with tournaments and winning and may the best man win or best person or whoever, right? The most skilled person is the champion at the end, right? Like hockey then you need to have this you know, non-moving Pareto Frontier where everyone gets access to all the same stuff, right? You know, Like I said before, if one Major League Baseball guy has metal bats because he paid a million dollars for it and th that makes him break the rules, then suddenly he has this huge advantage and it's, you know, if he wins the World Series, that's, that's BS. So Team Fortress Steroids two. did the same thing. We'll keep this nice dandy graph up. So they have all these items they added to the game. You can grind for some of them, you can pay for some of them. You know, they make their money with people buying these things. Some of them have no game effect. They add some color to the character, whatever. Yeah, my sandwich looks different. Does same thing. Or some of them give you a power. They give you something. A gun is different. You have to give something up to get all those weapons. The weapons are all fundamentally different, and there is no item that is absolutely better in a Pareto sense than any other item. And if you add options, like if I give you in a Dota clone more characters you can buy, and they're all along the Pareto frontier. To uh, paraphrase Dr. Hazard, the only unfairness I'm introducing on any fundamental level is that I'm increasing the cognitive load of the other players, but they don't get the benefit of those extra choices. You have to worry about these 10 other sandwiches I have access to, and I can pick among them, but you don't have access to them, but you have st still have to take them into account when you're playing against me. 
But that is a much more fiddly definition of fair that doesn't rankle right. nearly All his many sandwiches patterns. are still equal to the five sandwiches that I have, even though he has 20 different ones, right? So none of them are just better than any of the ones I have. But I'm sitting there and I'm like, which sandwich did he pick? Because I have to make a different move and pick a different stuff depending on what he picked, rock, paper, scissors kind of situation. So I have to think about 20 different sandwiches and what I would do if he used each one. He's only got to think about five because I've only got five and he knows I didn't pay any money. Because right? I'm cheap or I'm poor, I'm a little kid. So there's another monetization model, a very popular one, a very unpopular one, uh, the subscription model. Hey, you want to play my game? 20 bucks a month. Yeah, the subscription model is actually pretty old, right? It seems like throughout history, you know, there, were, there was the no, well, relatively, you know, none monetization model, right? Academia pays for the game and we just play Space War in the lab, right? And then it was, you know, you buy the game and it was you pay, put quarters in the arcade for the game. And those are pretty much the two for a while. Subscription was pretty much the third one, right? I think some of the first subscription games were MUDs uh, in the 80s and things like that. You know, you'd pay a subscription and then they would let you dial into the MUD and you could play it, right? And that carried over to MMOs. Uh, the reason for the subscription model was because some games, you know, network games, multiplayer games, required centralized servers as opposed to distributed servers. Now right? think of this, we talked about after money. What if your vision, your game, requires infrastructure? Now, you need after money just to keep the game going, or the game disappears and you have failed. You so already, you are forced to have a business model that gives you money forever. It's or at least as long as anyone's going to play your game. Yeah, it's almost not even before or after money, but during money. Right? It's like you have to keep getting money all the time or else the game will disappear off the face of the earth, tribes do. So if I want to make, <laughs> if I want to make an MMO, like World of Warcraft, I was like, yeah, 50 bucks, here's access to the game. World of Warcraft would not have been around by this point. Because I don't think many new people are getting World of Warcraft accounts in the volumes necessary to pay for all those servers. Right, you would have to have new sign-ups every month of millions and millions of people to pay all those servers, right? And once the whole world is, is, has paid the $50, then what? Now right. think about how this model changes your game. What if you're trying to make a game like Mario 1, like a simple, a Super Meat Boy style platformer or something? Who's going to pay $5 a month for access to a game like that? A single player test of skill. Right. Well, they might if it's a, if it's a really good platformer that's worth fifty dollars to you. Right. Yep. And but a subscription, you might pay five dollars, play it for a month, and try to beat it in that month. And if you do, just stop paying, and you only get five instead of fifty. Right. Or maybe you, it takes two months to beat it, so you'll pay ten, and then you'll cancel. And then it, so so it's not really going to work out, you know. And it, it gives you incentive to make the game much much harder, to make it longer for you know take longer for people to beat it, so they have to stay subscribed for a longer amount of time. And now you're destroying your vision because you've already made your game harder and done all these other things to it to get people to keep playing longer. So how many of you have played World of Warcraft or a game like it, and you didn't really want to, you felt obligated to, or you played it? But you weren't necessarily enjoying it, but there was perhaps external social pressure. You are I need you, are you to go pushed. on this raid, yo. If you're yeah. making a game... It's not, we're not going to make it without you. With a subscription model... We have no friends. You're the only healer we know. <laughs> you are pressured into making your game have these elements, into having a game that will trick you into forcing your friends to keep paying for your game by making them feel bad if they quit or the sunk cost. You want it to be stateful, maybe. You have a character. You wouldn't want your character to die. What if Nintendogs was a dollar a month? Yeah. So, you Would know. you stop paying? <laughs> Ever? <laughs> Or would that dog be in your will and your, grand your grandkids are like, what Tamagashi is this? Done this. <laughs> so already your vision, there's all this pressure on your vision. But one specific one, this is where ethics and gaming get in. Not to get into all the details of this graph, but there's the idea of reinforcement. Uh, you know, Pavlov kind of stuff. I want a rat to figure out, to push a little lever, and a food pellet comes out. Well, what if I make the food pellets come out, you know, not all the time, only 80% of the time? What if I, there's all these different, like, ratios of reinforcement. It turns out that if you give someone a reward, unreliably, they become more invested in the thing. Right. It triggers addictive behavior in humans. We're trying to get that rat to pull that lever as many times as possible, as frequently as possible. The rat is addicted to pulling the lever, right? If we just give him a food every time he pulls the lever, 
right? Well, he'll get kind of addicted to it, right? But he might also get bored with it because it's so predictable, right? There's no excitement there, you know? Uh, it, there's no underlying subconscious psychological thing going on. It's sort of just like, I mean, the grocery store like, works like that, right? You go there, you buy food, they give it to you all the time. There's no question, <laughs> right? You're not addicted to the grocery store, right? You're not like, oh man, bananas, <laughs> right? You could also come out, right, and be like, okay, you know, it, it never works, right? You go, you pull the lever, nothing ever happens. No one's going to pull that lever, right? But what if you pull the lever, and sometimes when you pull the lever, goodies come out, and in fact, sometimes you pull the lever, a hundred goodies come out, and sometimes nothing comes out. That's starting to sound a lot like a slot machine. <laughs> and the thing is, casinos and lottery boards have studied the ever-living crap out of this. And many of you, especially if you're in a city, you go to a bodega or a little deli somewhere, they always have these scratch-off lottery tickets. There's almost always the little old lady or the dude buying like 10 of them and Where's scratching the them all off right there. If they made those tickets different to where you didn't have to scratch it off, it might not scratch the same itch. The science of making the payoff matrices just enough to make you addicted is very well refined. They could just make a thing. Think about it. They could just make a thing where you put a dollar in and it goes, you lose, put a dollar in. You win two dollars, two dollars come out. You put a dollar in and it just tells you immediately there's no lever pulling, there's no scratching, there's no doing part, right? And it's just, you know, you put the money in and it tells you if you won. No one would do it. It would be boring as hell. Now, maybe <laughs> there are ethical concerns. Maybe you don't want people to get addicted to your game. You don't want these things to happen. You want it to be that kind of game. These things will happen in the course of game design whether you realize it or not. We did a lecture a couple of packs ago about this sort of thing, but the whole panel was about that. And afterward, a couple of Blizzard employees came up. They're like, yeah, that was awesome. But we didn't do any of that analysis when we made World of Warcraft. It was mostly trial and error. Right. Now, here's the thing, right? You could come up with this, and casinos come up with this, right, by doing math beforehand. They say, how can we get the most people to sit at that slot machine for the longest? And they figure out scientifically, you know, they do math in the lab, and they do tests and all these experiments, and they figure it out beforehand, right? Video game companies, very few of them, with exceptions like Dr. Hazard, right? And Zynga. Right. <laughs> Even Zynga doesn't do it. Uh, they don't have this sort of, you know, game theory knowledge, scientific knowledge, experimental resources, right? But they still succeed because what they do is trial and error, right? They use statistics, right? They'll look, you know, in the olden days with arcades, they would look at how many quarters were in the thing, and that's how they knew which, you know, and they'd be like, okay, we made the guy shoot more bullets faster, and there were more quarters in this week. So right. imagine, you know, World of Warcraft, nobody making that game in the early days when that was the secret project was thinking, let's try to get everyone addicted to the game, dangerously addicted to where they will hate playing our game, but keep paying us right. anyway. What they did is they looked at that subscription number chart that was up on the wall and came in their email every week of how many new subscribers there were. And they looked at what they had changed in that time period, right, since the last report. And they were able to figure out over a very long period of time with a very large set of data and very large number of players players, which, they, you know, oh, that guy played the longest, and he really liked doing the PvP, so I guess whatever we changed in the PvP, you know, really made him like it more, so those are good changes. Let's try to make changes like that and the other parts and see if those work. That could happen trial even, and error, and you get it the same answer either way. That'll happen even when you're just developing a game on your own. You're doing something that, oh, people are more interested in the game. I'm making the game more fun. You are, but you're also going in that, in that direction of the slot machine, and you have to think about whether or not that's what you want your game to be. If your game is a subscription model game, you are really pushed in that direction or you're not going to make enough money possibly. <coughs> so, let's talk about some more examples here of games that have done this. Because Deus Ex Human Revolution, I paid, I think, $12 for it. I paid zero because I didn't pay it play. When will you buy it? When it's like a dollar. So, <laughs> you know, we talked a little bit about Steam and the summer sales, but Steam and these sorts of summer sale things are starting to cause a problem for the game industry. Because people know they have trained us. I bought Fallout 3 for like $60. Me too. And it wasn't that long until the Game of the Year edition came out, and I could have bought it for like $30 with all that DLC. I don't have any of those DLCs because I not I felt really them. gypped. They trained me to never buy a game until a year after it comes out. I only buy Game of the Year editions. Forget so it. prices drop off rapidly. So we're really at this point to where if you're going to just sell your game, you're almost forced to consider doing DLC, consider doing expansions, consider other means of monetization that aren't actually just selling the game. And look at the rise of things like on-disc DLC. That is a huge push. Think about conceptually. There's stuff in this game where the developers might have been thinking, for example, they had this thing, you could throw it at a lock from a distance. 
and it would auto-hack the lock. That's pretty cool, right? You only got that if you pre-ordered at particular stores. They turned that item into monetization. Now, it's a single-player game. I'm never going to argue that a single-player game has to be fair, because the computer doesn't have to have fun. <laughs> but the developer might have been thinking, you know, the guy, you know, whoever's working on it said, hey, that's a cool idea. And then someone thinks, wait a minute, that would be really good for the DLC, and they don't put it in the original game. Even if no one has any ill intent, they're just trying to make the best game they can, you might be influenced in your decisions in game making if you know that DLC is part of your model down the road. And there are studies with doctors. Doctors think that they are not influenced by drug companies giving them gifts. Yeah, they think, oh, Pfizer gave me a million dollars. I'm not going to subscribe you know, Pfizer drugs more often than anything else. I have medical ethics. All right, it's, it's this whole thing where you're corrupt and you don't know it. You wonder, like, how can people be so evil? This doctor took money from that pharmaceutical company and then he sold all, he gave all his patients prescriptions for the company's drugs, even if they didn't need them, right? The doctor doesn't know he's doing it. And there's actually scientific evidence, right, and a lot of experiments to prove this, right? They go to the doctors and they see who gave them money, right? And they, over a course of many years, they, they count how many drugs the doctors prescribe per company of different things. And it turns out you go to interview the doctor and they say, hey, doctor, do you favor company X when you're prescribing drugs? And they say, no, I give the patients exactly what they need. But then it's they look at his better. prescription records. And uh, he is, they showed the You I saw gave a video. prescriptions for company X drugs 50% more than the average doctor. Right? They showed these results to doctors and the doctors were flabbergasted. Yeah, they were so, like, what? I don't do that. What? It's crazy. So back to your vision. This stuff is going to influence you even if you don't realize it. Right, you're as soon as you there, choose this model. You're thinking, I'm not ruining my game by being evil and putting stuff in DLC. You're, I'm not going to make this game evil at all. I'm, I'm, I'm such a good guy, right? And then, you know, you need to make money. You're hungry. And then it happens, and you'll justify it to yourself somehow or not even realize you did it, and it'll be done. Or subtle ways. Like, you might think of a cool concept, and you would normally discard it. But because of your monetization model, you might force it to stay in the game. Like little subtle changes about whether or not the game should be, you know, 20 minutes long or 40 minutes long. All that little stuff is going to change in subtle ways. So there's another interesting problem. This is a graph I stole. There was a lecture a couple of packs ago. We West, didn't even West attend packs, it. West packs. Yeah. And the idea was that it turns out if you have a game on Xbox Live or the PlayStation Market and you have a demo, you're going to sell, on average, far fewer copies than if you have no demo. Demos kill the sales of your game compared to trailers, which greatly increase the sales of your game. Right, the this bottom, is one graph among many. People are really looking into this topic. If right you now. can't see the lines, right, the bottom line is purple. That's no demo, no trailer. The line above that is red, which is demo only. The line above that, which is blue, is demo and trailer. The line that sold a ton of copies, way up above all the others, is trailer only. Now, I like to call this. Black Bastard Syndrome, because Black Bastard, many of you have seen Black Dynamite, an excellent uh, black exploitation like callback film. I enjoy it. There's a comic that is like that. But we were at, we were at the, uh, what was it? It was a Wizard World Philadelphia. Yep. And we're walking and this, you know, through the artist alley, and there's a guy in a full pimp costume. It is unbelievable. It is the greatest pimp I've ever seen, even better than Pokey Pimp. Right? And he's like, check out my comic, Black Bastard. And I'm looking at the comic, and I'm like, all right, I don't care what is in the comic. And he was almost a Stephen Colbertian instance of never breaking character. <laughs> now, the idea is very strong, and you look like, wow, that's awesome. I got to read that. You flip through the first few pages, and you pretty much get the deal. So unless you're hardcore about like particular black exploitation media, which is a very is particular your thing, niche market, right? Your number one thing. You don't really need to own the comic. You just need to see that it exists, get the gist of it, and you don't really feel like you got to pay money for it. Another example is Teen Boat. <laughs> I like Teen Boat. Though. It's like a werewolf, but he's a werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. It's funny, but that's pretty much it for most people. <laughs> I like it. I like Scott's going to read the next 10 volumes, but most of you are not. You're going to read one page and go, oh, I get it. He's a whereboat. He has high school troubles, but then, you know, he turns into a boat so all his friends can have a drunken party on him. So how many times have you been playing a demo of a game and you think, oh, I get it. It's like a mashup of Super Meat Boy and Akron. Okay, cool. Well, that was fun. I'm done with that. I got that. I figured that out. Right. And because you played the demo, you got everything you were going to get, right? You saw the cover of Black Bastard, and you don't need to you know, read the inside or pay $5 for it. And that's what a demo does. It gives you everything that you needed to know, and now you don't need to buy. But if you have that appeal in the trailer, but you don't give them the demo, 
then they're going to think, oh, team vote. I can see what that's about. Right. And you, they're going to buy it. This is why you might be thinking, all these companies out there, it's like, how come you guys only show these trailers with bull shots in them? How come you don't show me the gameplay that's not doctored or anything like that, right? Because it scientifically proven, right? The statistics show sales way, way up with, you know, just a bunch of bull shots, right? You know, the trailer makes people go ooh and ah, and then they have to find out what the game's about, but the only way to do that is to actually buy it. So everyone buys it, and then they play it for five minutes, and then it sits in your stack, just like when you buy a bundle on Steam, and you only play two games in it, and the rest of them sit in the list, installed, taking up space in the hard drive. So this, too, can mess up your vision. Because, for example, now, if you know you've that a demo will hurt sales, you can't try to sell a game that it isn't obvious what kind of game it is. Catherine, imagine if no one had any idea what Catherine was. Does anyone know the game Catherine? Yeah, you guys, okay, they know what we're talking about. You know, the demo, like, I got it. I was like, oh, I get what kind of game this is. There's a lot going on in there. But they could construct a trailer to show whatever kind of game they wanted from what that game was. So you're very tempted to make a game that has very good trailer appeal, but you're not tempted to make a game where someone would actually have to sit down with a demo to get it because if it's one of those really unique concepts that needs a demo, the demo alone is going to tank your sales in many instances. So one option with Just Sell It is the UGC, the user-generated content. Now, if that's already not a part of your vision, obviously you've compromised on your vision if you start adding you DL, if you're adding this, you're letting your users Add content to the game. Yeah, it's uh, you know it's obvious. You know, Minecraft is obviously number one example, but other things like uh, Little Big Planet, right? Games yep. that allow you, you know, they're tools that allow you to make something, right? And if people can make something with your game, Mario Paint, perfect, you know, maybe the first, I don't know. Uh, then they can spread it around on the internet, and then that, that you know people will want to make things like that thing that that they, someone else made in that game, so they'll buy the game instead, right? So having a game with any sort of UGC or user creativity ways for you know the players to express themselves and share those expressions on the internet, right, is going to get big sales. So there's a huge incentive for anyone just selling a game these days to do those things simply because the internet exists. But Even as soon as you want to do that, like imagine if they got like an MMO, like a World of Warcraft, if they wanted to let you just straight up import your own character model, like you can model whatever you want. Like Second Life. Can you imagine how much work it would be for them? So already they need more money for it. So if you, But if you're just making your vision... You're going to have to change how you get your money, maybe increase your budget if you want to add user-generated content. But if you're just selling your game, you have an incentive to have a user-generated content structure because otherwise you might not be able to monetize too well. Oh, Angry Birds. Could just sell it for a dollar. Yeah, you know, and it's like you think of just sell it as like, you know, the most basic way, you know, to, to get your after money, right? You pay money, you get the game, end of story, right? But it's sort of different when the price is so ludicrously low. You know, that it enters this different territory, right? I think about, buy, I bought Angry Birds Space. You know why? Because it costs less than a bagel. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I buy a bagel for $1.25, and that's a street cart bagel, right? Angry Birds is going to help me out, you know, giving me something to do when I'm on the crapper for, like, at least a couple weeks. <laughs> you know, that's, well, it's worth more than the 30 seconds of pleasure I'm going to get from that bagel. So I can pay the dollar for it, right? But what kind of, you know, influence does that have on the game of Angry Birds, right? It, you know, it has to be... You know, they have to do something to that game to make you want to pay that dollar, right? And they also, right, well, you know, it's, it's not just make you want to pay the dollar. It's make as many people as possible pay the dollar, right? If you have a game with a high price, it's okay if you only sell it to a few people. You can have, like, a niche game just for the hardcore people and sell it for 100 bucks and, you know, steel battalion kind of situation, big joysticks. You don't need to sell that many and you're going to be good. With Angry Birds... At a dollar, you need to sell a bajillion because you're only getting a dollar. But now the game has to be small. It has to work on a phone because that's the only place you're going to sell games for a dollar in any volume. And as soon as you have to be on a phone, you're constrained in these technical ways now. You have to worry about what platforms you're going to support, what platform you're going to use to develop it, you know, all that other yeah. stuff. Yeah, the monies isn't the only thing that affects your game design, right? It's also you know, the platform, the technology, and they're all tied together, right? But the effects the money has are probably the least explored. It's always the reverse that people inspect. You know, it, what effect does the game have on the money, not what effect the money has on the game? Uh, one of the oldest models in the book. Put in a quarter, play for 10 seconds because the game is balls hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you play Ninja Turtles, right? It's, you can't beat it. <laughs> it's yeah, not that, possible. That Dungeons and Dragons game, that red dragon kills you, guaranteed, at least once. There's no, has anyone played that one? Yeah? No? 
Oh, you've never played D&D arcade game? Oh my god. I feel really old now. Yeah. I would always be the cleric because wait a minute, you wait a minute. turn undead infinity times. So anytime skeletons showed up, I'd just be like, oh. Which is like twice in the whole game. They shove a lot. It's a really. You have to take the north road through the cave. Oh, no, you the don't north. go through the north. Screw that. <laughs> Here, I'll make us feel old. How many of you have been to an arcade that wasn't at a convention? Okay, that's oh, good. All right. Never mind. It's not, it's not dead yet. All right. It's not dead yet. <laughs> So I think the ways that this model affects your game are obvious. You can't let someone beat the whole game on one quarter. There's physical constraints if you want to put it in a real arcade. Uh, the game has to be such that that tiny speck of play you get for the first payment is enough to challenge you and yet make you want to play more, but yet not be so easy that you're not going to have to pay again and not be so hard that you put in one more quarter and then quit. You've also got to make the ca the cabinet of the game really attractive so that people walking by will go, ooh, what is this thing? And they'll just want to sort of investigate it. Even if they don't like it and it turns out to be a crappy game, they still put in one quarter. And like, you know, like one of those submarine games, a lot of those are pretty crummy. There's only a couple good ones, right? But it's like, what's in there? Right? So everyone who walks by puts in one quarter, plays it, and goes, ah. <laughs> but it still gets a lot of quarters if a lot of people come in the arcade. You know? So, it, you know. Now, this is a model that I think hasn't been explored recently. People have not really tried to do the arcade model of pay-as-you-go like this. Well, they do it with crane games. They crane do. games are real big these days. In arcades. <laughs> yeah. Where's much. the pay-as-you-go MMO that isn't actually a free-to-play game? Yeah, I think the Xbox, I don't know if they still have it, but for a while they had a thing where you could go in and like pay like a quarter, to, and they had a MAME emulator. You could, so you could play an arcade game on your Xbox once as if you had put in a real quarter. I don't think anyone There's not a lot of that. appeal in that. No, not really. So we're going to share one of our visions with you because we have a vision. vision. We and do. We have a lot of visions. We share this vision. We're never going to make this. It's just an idea. That I well, love. one, Neil Gaiman said this, to paraphrase, ideas aren't worth anything on their own. So anyone who thinks you have a great game idea, if you haven't made it, that idea is worth nothing. Yeah, any idea for anything that you have. A lot of people keep their ideas secret. Like, I don't want to tell you my idea because you might steal it. No, your idea is worthless. All right? If you have an idea, you should tell it to as many people as possible so that they can help you refine it and bounce things off you. They're not going to make your idea. It's your idea, which is why you care about it. Rim doesn't care about my idea. All right? And if he does, team up. <laughs> now, right? if, any of you, we'll something done. if any of you make our vision, go for it. I think there's money there. So I have want, all my babies, all now, zero of them. This is a great example of how the monetization model has to be tied at the beginning during the conceptual process to the game itself, or else it wouldn't work. This is a game that cannot be monetized in any normal, expected, reasonable, like currently used way. All right, so I'm going to tell you my pure vision, right? We're not worrying about any money, so imagine this game, close your eyes, right? <laughs> It's an MMO, right? It's actually an MMO. As in, there is one world, and everyone is on it. There's no instances, there's no nothing. Fully stateful, 24-7. Right? Every person is on the same server, on the same thing, in the same place, right? When something changes, it changes permanently. Someone blows up the house, it's gone, <laughs> right? Someone digs a hole, it's a hole. Someone fills in the hole, it's filled in. Get your dirt out of Boss Keen's ditch. All right, uh, in addition, the world is wicked dangerous, right? Crazy dangerous, because it's the Terminator world. There's or, 100 killers everywhere. Or a legally, right, similarly unlicensed equivalent. <laughs> right? it's, the, it's the Berminator. Right, the future Terminator world, right? Past Doomsday, you walk out of, like, the human area, and it's just like, oh, hell no. Right? <laughs> You're dead. <laughs> Forget it, right? In addition... It's an action game. It's not some level up game. It's not some, you know, got magic powers game, right? In this game, it's skills. You control your dude in real time, right? You push buttons to hit, you push buttons to jump, like Metal Gear, right? You control your dude fully. Now, we want ways to get better, but no stateful character stuff. You're not gonna, like, level up this character and it gets better over time because you played more. No, you fight, like, Fallout. You find a flamethrower, you got a flamethrower. Yeah, Fallout has levels. You die, no flamethrower. <laughs> right? There won't be levels, but there will be equipment, right? You find some body armor somewhere out there, or maybe you destroy a robot, right? He's holding a big minigun there. If someone manages to take him out, good luck. You can take that minigun maybe if you can pick it up. Right. I want this game to be where people get together and they make, like, the humans all get together with their lives and they build, like, a little fortress and try to hold out and, like, expand out and build a little city, build a little citadel. All right. So the game will all be, will be completely about the people playing it having to cooperate with each other because you're not making it anywhere on your own other than the meat grinder, right? <laughs> you got to go out there with a team of people, all these other real players. You have to organize completely on your own. There's no guilds or anything. It's just up to you. It's up to us. 
right? You get a bunch of people together so that when you run out, there's enough meat shields and someone's going to make it somewhere where there's some stuff. Right? Maybe you can set something up and get some defenses going and you know, maybe eventually right, the Terminator that looks like a person sneaks in and then you're in trouble again, but right, it'll be like that. Now, we want it also to be a game that can end. Yeah. You can destroy Skynet and that's it. Game over, just turn it off forever. Or maybe we start it over, we're not maybe. sure. Maybe. But we want it to be a game where everything you do matters or doesn't get you dive right away, but it still changed the world. And eventually, if you gang up enough, you can beat it. You can change the world and win, and everybody celebrates. Right. The other thing about the game, right, is that, of course, when you die, you're dead, right? It's just, forget it, you need, a, you need to make a new everything, right? There is no, oh, I'll go out and get my corpse. No, no, no. You can go out and get your corpse. Maybe the minigun will still be next to it, if you're lucky. Uh, <laughs> if someone else didn't take it, or, if, you know, who knows what. But you're dead. Everything is reset back to zero, back to the beginning of the game, wherever that may be, some cave or something. So how the hell... Do we make money off of this game? Or even have money to make this game? <laughs> subscription? It's an MMO. MMOs are supposed to be subscription models, right? Oh, but look how many went free to play because they couldn't scratch it in the subscription world. Well, And those are ones that were trying to get people to you know, be addicted and keep playing, right? We're not even trying that. You're not addicted to this game. You're going to play and you're going to say, this is too hard. I'm dead. I don't care anymore. And that's it. Right? No one's going to keep paying And we every purposefully month month. do not want... Look at how we're constraining this already. We don't want levels. We don't want to level up. So there's, and your characters are going to be... You know, they die easily. So you're not going to have that sunk cost. No one will ever say, I want to keep my 60th level dude. They're going to keep say, I want to keep my 45 minute dude. <laughs> I mean, it'll be on the high score table maybe of like how long you made it or how, where, how far you got away from the safe area. If there is one, there won't be. Uh, right? But it's like, other than that, dead is dead, right? There's really not too many people other than me who actually want to play this game, right? You might think that my idea is cool, it's just my crazy idea, yep. right? But we really, you're going to play, you're going to get frustrated as hell because it's going to be balls hard, right? And you're never going to play it again. You'll maybe try the demo and that'll be it. We need staff, we need servers, we need infrastructure, there's all this stuff. So why don't we make an arcade monetized MMO. No, we could. We could make it to where you pay for every life, right? And that this might actually work, right? It's similar to an arcade game. You play, you, you keep going, right? Because if there's a high barrier to entry, you know, 70 bucks and then 40 bucks a month, no one's going to pay the 70 bucks to start playing the game that's so hard and so crazy that doesn't even have critical mass. And you saw what happened with Team Fortress 2. You want to have a lot of people playing a game like this. Team Fortress 2 isn't fun if there's nobody on your server to play with you. This game sucks if you're the only dude on the server. It's impossible. <laughs> we gotta get a ton of people in. It's okay if they're meat shields. And we don't want them to feel bad. For meat having shield's gonna feel real bad because he spent 25 cents being a meat shield. <laughs> Better than spending $70 to be a meat shield. That's true, but he's only gonna spend that 25 cents once, right? Even if this game is really impressive with the graphics, which I would like it to be as part of my vision, right? People might really think it's a great idea at the beginning, so we get tons of quarters pour pouring in in the first few weeks. And then... Now, the point of all this is that, you know, we've talked about this game a lot on our own. <laughs> As we design this, you can see how we found a model that fit our vision, and the two are affecting each other. Our vision's already being affected by the model, but we've chosen a model that meshes with the vision. It's almost mechanism design, which is the idea that the designer of a game is interested in how the players play the game. It's used in, like, regulation in the stock market. It's used in some games you play. You know, the game affects the players, and you want to control that. Now we're picking monetization models that while they change our game, they push it in the direction we're going anyway. Yeah, but you know, you see that no matter what money, if we pick any of the before or after monies, right, no matter which ones currently exist and are really popular and successful, right, I have come up with this vision, and really this is my legitimate vision, I didn't just come up with it as an example for this panel, right, I've thought about this for a while. Uh, none of the existing monetization models will work and make any money with this game, even if the game is really cool. Right, in the current landscape of humanity and gaming culture and society, right? You would need to come up with something new or you would need to change the game and destroy the vision in some way. We could go free to play, you can pay for better characters. Then Bill Gates can just destroy Skynet. And that ruins my game. It's over. I, I mean I can't even come up with one, right? If we if we kickstart, we gotta spend all our time making rewards. Well who wants a reward that doesn't do anything? Like, hey, your guy's pink, great, he stands out, and then he's <laughs> <laughs> You know, we can't give a guy a better sandwich to start with. That's not fair, right? I want this to be a fair and skill-based game, and most people don't like skill-based games. So let's, in the remaining five minutes we've got, let's try to monetize a vision that is so ridiculous 
that the constraints will prevent you from making anything even close to a realistic modern game. <laughs> Pax Enforcer, the game. It's real time. It takes three days to play this game. Oh, yeah. no way. Actually, it takes like a week and four days because you got to start at the bag stuffing. I no want game. this to be a top-down, like, Sims kind of game where you're controlling all these enforcers and you have to manage packs. But it's real time. And there's some games that did real time. There's a game called, I think, D. Are like you ready for the game ago. that takes nine, you know, a whole hour and all you do is sit behind a booth and watch two morons, right? <laughs> Talk until they feel bad, right? You want to play that this game? That is really boring. <laughs> sit, me and Scott sit down to play this game on Friday, no, Thursday night and we play nonstop. We sleep in shifts. <laughs> it's so, like, do you want to play, you know, the expo hall game where you sit there and it's, you just look and if anyone's doing anything bad, you go, hey. <laughs> now we haven't decided how to monetize this. Is that so bad real? Okay. So how do we monetize a game like this? Well, all right, we can't really sell that. Because who's going to play that more Nobody. than once, if ever? And even then, all you right. Use it for enforcer training. Pax will buy it and that will be it. So It'll be an enforcer <laughs> simulator? Right, right, so the way to use it, right, to train new enforcers, we can sell it the way they sell like air, airline simulators, right? Only one customer they pay a zillion dollars for because it it's so good and that's it. It's not a bad model, but not it's also bad. kind of risky. It is, because your is probably like, we don't need this, this is stupid. And they're going <laughs> to... We can trade an enforcer for like $5. And also, if we made it that way, they're going to want to add all the secret stuff, like all the money stuff and all the, you know, to make it a real simulation. Now we can't sell it to the public anymore, and that ruins my vision. I can't play it. Well, Unless I take up the black. Maybe they use it as a recruitment model. You want to play this game? That's going to make everybody not sign up. <laughs> it kind of turns into Ender's Game. What if that was controlling the enforcers? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the technology for that yet, but we will. <laughs> All right. So maybe, okay, so maybe we try to sell it. How about we could do something like, you know, what if we made it coincide with PAX for the people who can't go to PAX? So we get a feed from PAX of, you know, crises, or maybe it's a sewer random set of crises. Panelists didn't show up. A uh, projector caught on fire. Naked guy. <laughs> and you're playing, you know, the head of PAX, and you're, or Robert Koo, whatever, and you're like, Enforcer, fix that, da, da, da. You've got, like, this live streaming PAX that you're running. You can walk into a panel room and watch one of the panels or something. Well, that is even crazier to monetize. So maybe we meet somewhere in the middle. There's the EA model of, you know, I've got a sports game, and they make a new roster every year. So maybe you buy a subscription, and every year you get the updates from the previous packs. And you can oh, man. I can't, and then everyone will know that he quit enforcing that jerk. <laughs> right? He was the best guy last year. He had all these high stats. Oh. Now I've got to use this noob who's never enforced before. I'm just trying to get a free badge. Oh. <laughs> that would be an interesting model. Maybe you're trying to do it with advertising. You know, the expo hall is the only part where the ads change based on who's buying ads on the But outside. now you're not getting your authentic PAX experience that was part of your vision, right? If you wanted to be authentic, it would have to have the same exact ads as the expo hall. But all those companies will sue you as soon as you put their stuff in your game, right? So you have to sell ads. Maybe you only can sell ads. You know, and when the game is new, you can maybe sell an ad or two. But when the game's old, no one's going to buy any. So it'll just be this big gray expo hall with nothing doing, except a bunch of fake games. Right? And maybe when you first sell it, only one sponsor will come through, so the entire Expo Hall will just be like Nintendo and there's nothing else in there. Right. I so think we're just about a time. So my homework for you, if you want to think about how monetization models will affect your game, try to come up with a way to make money off of this crazy PAX idea. Yeah, come up with any, just, you know, sit there and think of if there was an enforcer game, right, what you would like it to be. Don't worry about anything else, right? Just what game would be the awesomest PAX Enforcer game, right? That's all, that's the only idea that you have to keep in there is the idea that there's a PAX Enforcer, the game. And then afterwards, figure out a way to make money off of that game before and after monies, right? Without compromising or in any way changing that awesome idea that you had. And, and it will be really, very difficult. Really think about it. Because <laughs> as you do, you're going to go down all, you know, we could, we could have talked for four hours about, you know, different visions and how to monetize them and all that. But we got an hour and in exactly 50 seconds, we're going to leave this room and get on a car, portal, train, bus, something to anime Boston. Uh, are we done? So we've got flyers here. We cannot take questions, as we said. But we've got flyers here you can take that will link to probably the video of this panel and the video of many other panels we've done at previous PAXs. And if you email us, we will oh, probably respond. Yeah. One too many times. We also have QR codes. If you don't want to take a flyer, you can just take a picture of one of these with your phone. It's an experiment. Yeah, the vision.
Thank you.